Well, it's certainly lovely to be here. It's uh, been a few years uh, since I've been to Alara, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful place. And um, yes, Daniel mentioned I've, uh, I've known him for some time, and uh, certainly a pleasure to be here uh, tonight to share a little tour, uh, I guess you could say, of the Louvre. Um, my interest in the world of art is that I grew up in a home where my uh, stepfather was a, an artist and sculptor and a university senior lecturer in, in the world of art. And uh, also in my, in my days of, uh, of business, my, uh, in advertising, I would uh, um, pre uh, present to different clients and I'm a, I'm a strategic uh, thinker and so I'd share the, the strategies with for instance, Ferrero, and, um, and then my creative partner, which as soon as he showed the pictures, people had come to life. <laughs> and so I could see the value in, in art, and I've certainly made it a, an interest in, as a historian um, to see the way that the arts have influenced the Christian church through the century is a particular passion of mine. And so in, in this series, as we look at the, the Louvre, our focus will be on the way that the Christian art has influenced history um, and we're, we're going to concentrate on the Louvre Museum. Uh, it's been my pleasure to visit, <laughs> I think, just about every um, major art museum in the world and uh, the Louvre is, is, uh, is a special one. So come with me and we'll, we'll head into the, uh, to the Louvre Museum. It's the largest and most visited museum in the world. It has 35,000 artefacts and another 420,000 in uh, storage and uh, so they've got plenty there. If you were to uh, spend eight hours a day and just one minute on each of those uh, paintings and artefacts you'd be there for I think it's 73 days to, uh, to soak it all in. And the, the Louvre is, uh, it has all of these uh, the different uh, types of uh, art there. The Louvre here took uh, 600 years in total to, to build to, to what it is today. So imagine if you uh, um, built a house and then 600 years later they handed you the keys. <laughs> Not quite like that, um, but, uh, but you, you get the point. For a start, it's 400 times bigger than the average house. So um, some of you no doubt have been to the Louvre probably on a number of occasions. It's a magnificent building uh, steeped in political and religious history. And uh, I encourage you to, to head over there if you haven't. The building began in 1190 as a uh, political fortress, really, against attackers in, in Paris. And it became a palace for the, the kings of France. And over time, some of the greatest works of art have hung on these, uh, on these walls. So let's begin by looking at one of the oldest pieces in the, the Louvre. And uh, this was a, a painting that was... Um, created for the, the parliament there in Paris and the idea was that to hang it up on the wall in parliament so when the politicians uh, were making their laws they kept Jesus Christ and uh, religion in mind to make sure they made good laws and moral laws and so that was the aim of it and if we have a look at this we can see that um, Jesus the crucified Christ is the center of the work of art. We have uh, the mother of Jesus here um, being consoled by Mary Magdalene and uh, this is John the Evangelist looking up to Jesus. We have John the Baptist here with uh, pointing to the Lamb and the Bible. We have uh, over here we have Saint Louis the Ninth and, uh, and he was known for um, really attacking anyone who he, he saw as blasphemous. He's also known uh, for the Crusades um, against the, the, the Muslims. And, uh, and what he would do, if you were guilty of blasphemy, he'd cut off your tongue and your lips and to, give you the, to make sure that you couldn't uh, keep going with it. And uh, then we have, over this side, we have the um, Charlemagne, known for, for bringing together the Roman Empire. And... The artist, the unknown artist, has also brought in here, I'll, I'll, I'll um, focus in, on St. Dennis. Now you can see him there. He uh, was uh, reportedly had his uh, head chopped off as a martyr. And this is how tradition 
um, <laughs> records it. And he was then said to uh, walk 10 kilometres preaching while he's holding his head. Well, of course, <laughs> that's, uh, that's tradition and, and some would believe that. So th they've got that um, there in that painting. But you'll notice up in this back corner is the Louvre and by the River Seine in Paris. Um, and there we have a, uh, from the 1400s, we have the, uh, the Louvre there. So that, that's one of the, 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 the great paintings of the Louvre. And what I'm going to do tonight is share some of the paintings that, that I found in my different trips to the Louvre have had a significant impact on me as a historian and, uh, and also an interest in the, in the Christian faith. King Francis transformed the, uh, the Louvre into a royal palace and uh, one of the things I can remember when I was just, I think I was in my early 20s and it was my first trip to Europe and coming from Australia and a fairly rural area of Australia to go in and see the, just the opulence of these buildings was like, wow, I, I sort of had never seen anything like it. And, uh, and certainly the, the, uh, the French knew how to, to, uh, to, to decorate. And uh, it, I found it just staggering. And it was that, this king who persuaded Leonardo da Vinci to leave uh, Italy and come and join him in his, in his royal palace uh, there in, in, uh, in Paris. The origin of Louvre or Louvre, uh, my, by the way, it's, uh, I, I know there's some here who speak French, I don't. My, my doctoral studies is in, uh, is based on Latin and Old German and even there it's reading rather than speaking. So French is not my, my area of expertise but from historians suggest that Louvre or Louvre um, originally came from the uh, meant castle or watchtower or the word uh, Louvre Terre is sort of a, a place where wolves were kept and uh, so uh, the, not quite sure but no matter the etymology one thing for sure is that the name or the brand Louvre or Louvre is v extremely valuable. In fact, uh, the, uh, if any of you have been to the Louvre Museum in, in Dubai, um, they paid uh, 650 million Australian dollars just to have the brand so that they could call it the Louvre uh, Museum there in Abu Dhabi. And so that's, uh, that's, that's how much the, um, they were willing to pay um, for that. And in this particular Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi, they have, um, I think they have about 600 works, including the most expensive painting ever sold, The Saviour of the World. But I remember going there and I said, well, okay, where is it? <laughs> it's nowhere to be seen. And the reason is because the great, uh, the, uh, the crown prince, you know, Mr. Liv Golf and, and all the rest of it, he, uh, from what I hear, he's got it on his own private yacht. So he's the one who, who forked out the money and why would he want it in the museum um, when he can have it there just hanging beside himself. So that's the, uh, that's the, the value of the, the brand. And certainly stories relating to the church history fascinate me, particularly in the early modern period throughout the, the 15th, the 16th and the, the 17th century. And the history of the Louvre includes quite a lot of attacks against um, Protestant um, Christians in particular, including the St Bartholomew's Day Massacre on the 24th of August, 1572. And in this, uh, on this day, um, Paris there, they, they, a whole lot of Huguenot Protestants came to Paris to attend a wedding. And uh, when they, they came to this, uh, um, uh, the, to, to Paris here, they were attacked because the wedding was actually the daughter of, um, of Catherine de, uh, Medici there, and she was going to have none of that, and so she ordered an attack. And as the church bells told, as some would say, um, she ordered an, an attack, and her son, King Charles IX, well, he was waiting there in the Louvre, in the window of the Louvre with his crossbow, ready to, to get these uh, Protestant Christians. And, uh, and the, the leader of the, the Protestants, they took him 
and they cut off his hands and his feet and they, dra they dragged him through the, the city. Uh, estimates are that throughout France 70,000 of these Huguenots were killed and the reports are blood was running through the streets and in the River Seine there were so, much, so many dead bodies that they couldn't eat the fish there for months. <laughs> and so this is the, the sort of um, history and the, the Christian and the religious history that is associated with the Louvre. Now, when this attack from the, the Louvre and from Paris took place, when the news came to, uh, to Pope Gregory XIII, he was jubilant. Uh, so, so much so that he, uh, he, by the way, in the Vatican you can see his symbol, which is the, the, the dragon there. <clears throat> and he declared a day of festivity and jubilation. And the fellow who, who actually came with the news, um, he gave him uh, a thousand crowns for his efforts. He sent the King of France a golden rose. And then he struck this medal here, this coin in honour of the fact of that uh, St Bartholomew's Day massacre. Well, let's move on a couple of hundred years um, into the 1793 when the Louvre opened as a museum for the people. Napoleon had become emperor and uh, as he, uh, he saw the Louvre, he had a real vision for the Louvre. And he said this, the Louvre can never be a comfortable residence. I regard it as a kind of ceremonial palace in which we must store all our riches in the field of art and science, such as statues, bronze sculptures, paintings, books, archives and medals. He even put, uh, if you go there today, you'll see plenty of N for Napoleon um, around the Louvre to ensure that his stamp was, was on it. And as you enter the, the, the museum today, the Louvre Museum, of course, there's just such wonderful artefacts and so huge um, that we have here from, from around the world, um, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, Rome, Greece, and um, here are just a few of them. The, uh, the, the, the Greek goddess of love and beauty you can see, and of course the, uh, the Nike, and uh, the wing victory of uh, Samothrace, uh, an island there of Greece, as you walk up those stairs. I'm <laughs> sure many of you can remember that if you have been uh, to the Louvre as you're going up those stairs there. But the Louvre is best known for its paintings. And uh, when it first began, there were about 500, now there's five and a half thousand. And uh, some of these paintings, they are so big. Um, and, and this would, uh, for the French, uh, paintings such as Liberty leading the people with the, the flag and uh, the, the, the independence and, and the republic, it's just a, a, a wonderful uh, painting for the, for the French. And also we have this enormous uh, painting here, the consecration of Napoleon and Josephine. Um, when it was uh, painted, Napoleon, here you can see Napoleon and he's about to put a crown on Josephine. And when it was painted, and Napoleon had a look at the painting that's now in the, in the Louvre, he, he, the Pope was originally just sitting there with his hands on his, uh, you know, on his lap, and Napoleon said, no, we're not having the Pope just sit there. He needs to do something, and so they, the, the artist made sure the Pope was blessing <laughs> the coronation. And so that's a, another of the, the great paintings there um, in the Louvre. This one here we're going to speak about tomorrow afternoon, Raft of Medusa. Once again, extremely important to French history and a wonderful story. I say wonderful, a, uh, a, a, a story that is of great uh, significance, to not only to the French, but I believe to us um, uh, today and we'll talk about that um, tomorrow but once again you can see the size of these uh, painting and for the rest of this uh, presentation tonight I'd like to share with you some of the highlights for me as I've as I've gone to the Louvre on a number of occasions and particularly as a Christian uh, as a historian and minister of religion the areas that uh, I have found quite fascinating the paintings so some of the things, uh, the, the photographer Ansel Adams said, pictures are usually looked at and seldom looked into. 
I, I find the same with paintings. In fact, when I was at the National Gallery of London each day for, for many, many um, yeah, days, uh, I'd noticed that the, the <coughs> tourists would come in. It's the same as the Louvre, and they'd come in and they'd look at a painting. Then they go to the next one. <laughs> they're looked at, but they're seldom looked into, and they're, they're very rarely researched to find the, the true meaning. Where you share the meaning, it's like, oh, okay, I get it now. So they can see the, the significance um, of it. And I wish that I had more time to be able to share some of these artefacts and paintings from the Louvre, but hopefully it'll give enough of a, a, a glimpse to, uh, to encourage us not just to the Louvre, by the way, but the Art Gallery here in New South Wales and so on, to where, wherever it happens to be, to, to look at the works of art that are so important to, um, to history and to the people who, who painted them. I know that some of you are artists and you have such a wonderful gift. I believe it's a gift from God. And uh, it's just a, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful part of life to, to, see, um, to see art. The first thing that I'd like to share with you is the Code of um, Hammurabi. This is more, not so much um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the arts, but, but certainly in terms of um, ar archaeology. The first book of the, oh, secondly, the, the Meshe Stele, and thirdly, the painting of the wedding at Cana, then the painting of young Martyr, and I'll go through each of these tonight, um, the death of the virgin, and finally, of course, the Mona Lisa, which we'll, we'll, once again we'll talk, more about, uh, we'll talk more about tomorrow. But the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, it tells the famous story of Noah's flood. Now, if ever there's a topic that I've found in my research, my main area of research is looking at the period from, um, well, actually from 1555 to 1618. But uh, it, it's, it's looking at the way art has been used in, in books and in churches to, to, to show Bible stories and Bible history. If there's one subject that artists loved in history, it's the story of Noah's flood. <laughs> Even the old Bibles, you get a lot of the old Bibles that are illustrated, but they had to pick their illustrations. They couldn't illustrate every story. But Noah and the flood, that's a really important one. And, uh, and so what, um, <clears throat> the, what we find here in Genesis 10, which tells the story of the, the flood, it's, it, it goes and it, 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 um, it talks about in Genesis 10 the descendants of Noah. And one of them was a fellow called Nimrod. And it says, Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And so <clears throat> here we find the start of Babel. And Nimrod means rebellion. I want to share with you now, I'm a collector of rare books, by the way, and rare printed materials. And I have here, this is from uh, 1473. This is an original printed page, so it's 530 years old. And you can, I've, I've got it up on the screen there as well. And this is, um, by the way, this book from which it came, Schiedel's Chronicle of the World, this is the book that Martin Luther, if you've heard of Martin Luther, when he was a young man, he read that book because it was the standard book on the history of the world. And there was a picture in there of Jesus and it frightened Martin Luther so much he thought, oh no, if God is like, so angry like that, then uh, this is, this is uh, I'm in big trouble. And so it's this book here, it's the Chronicle of the World. And so Martin Luther then started his journey into understanding what God is really like. Is he such an angry, nasty God? And so um, this, this book, the, the Chronicle of the World, and it shows the, the lineage, and this is Noah up here. And here's Nimrod down here. And so it, it tells the story, just as it has in, in Genesis chapter 10. Well, <clears throat> the building of the Tower of Babel. So Nimrod, remember, so we have Noah and the time of the flood. And then all the way down, and the kingdom of Babel was started there with Nimrod, a descendant of Noah. And during that time, they said, you know what? We never want another flood to wipe us out again. So they built this great tower, and uh, the, the Tower of Babel, 
and, uh, and, and some uh, Jewish writings indicate that it was uh, two and a half kilometres high. And uh, Josephus says that the, that the bricks were burnt and coated in bitumen so no water could ever get in to the Tower of Babel so they would be safe against God if, if, a, if another flood happened to come. And this particular painting in the Louvre um, by Lucas van Volkenborch, um, by the way, the Louvre has 18 paintings of the Tower of Babel, paintings and illustrations. That's another favourite. Just as the flood is a favourite, so is the Tower of Babel. And we can see Nimrod down here. He's checking out the, uh, checking out the building progress um, from this, in this painting here in the, in the Louvre. And the Bible indicates that um, during this building of this temple to try and outdo God, God sent them a confusion in their language. And so somebody's trying to say, well, can you pass me a mud brick? But he just started babbling out some language that, that they've never heard of um, before. And the word Babel is linked to the verb Balal, which means confusion. And over time, this Babel became Babylon or Babylon. And in the Louvre, there are many um, uh, pagan religious artefacts that have been linked, say, to Babylon from the time of Babylon, such as the, the sixth king in Babylon, Hammurabi, and uh, his worshipper of a pagan uh, god, um, the Ishtar vase, of course, in Babel, Babylon. They had the, if you go to Berlin, you'll see the great Ishtar gates. Um, and Isis and Horus from Egypt, once again in the Louvre, uh, the, the um, worship of, of pagan gods. And this is the code of Hammurabi. So we've gone through, we've gone through from Noah and then to Nimrod. He was the first king. And then the sixth king was Hammurabi. And so this is one of the most magnificent, um, uh, well, I think it's, um, well, uh, I'm just try, trying to think of just how, um, I know it's 4,000 years old, four tons, four ton slab, um, this here. And what it had is it had the laws for Babylon on there. And so let's, uh, and here we have Hammurabi, and coming before the sun god, Shamash. And the sun god is, is handing over the royal insignia to, uh, to Hammurabi, the king of Babylon. And underneath there is the laws of the land. So let's take a look at some. Code 153. If a woman had brought about... So this is 4,000 years old, by the way. <laughs> so if a woman had brought about the death of her husband because of another man, they shall impale that woman on stakes. So this, on this slab, this is the sort of thing they would have. If a barber, without the knowledge of his master, cut the sign of a slave on a slave not to be sold, the hands of this barber shall be cut off. So that was such an important law to them that they'd, they'd put it on there. If a builder build a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built fall in and kill its owner, then that builder shall be put to death. So you want to make sure you, you, uh, you build a house properly. Otherwise, you'll be the one who'll be going down the tubes. And, but outside the Louvre, that, 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 those laws are inside the Louvre. Outside the Louvre, they have sculptures of Moses here with the, uh, with the Ten Commandments. And I think there are a couple of uh, sculptures of Moses with the Ten Commandments. And so if you go through the Bible... The, the Ten Commandments are a, a, is a, a, a laws of God. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the book of Romans says, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and, uh, and good. So I found that the uh, Code of Hammurabi has enormous um, uh, impact on the, the history and showing how the, 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 uh, the laws worked all those years ago and compared them to Christian laws today. Then we have the Mesha Stele. This also is an archaeological uh, item. And what I've found also in my studies as a historian is that often the Bible is doubted to, because um, historians or archaeologists have not... Uh, the Bible will say something and then they'll say, oh, well, that's... Uh, you know, that's, uh, they just made that up. There's no record in history 
But then I found that, um, that archaeologists and historians come along and they suddenly they find what the Bible had said all along. And that's an example of that is this uh, stele here, this Phoenician script, that uh, 34 lines of Phoenician script. It was um, found in Jordan in 1868. And what it does is it confirms the stories from the Book of Kings, how the pagan Moabites had, uh, had attacked um, the Israelites when King Ahab died and how they worshipped Chemosh. Here it says, I am Misha, king of Moab, the Dibonite. I made this high place for Chemosh because it made me triumph over all my opponents. Omri was king of Israel and he oppressed Moab for many years. From there I took the sacred vessels of Yahweh and I dragged them before Chemosh. So here they are, they're actually in this stele, they're repeating a story that is, is told in the Bible, in the book of Kings. And so historians will say, oh look, no, that, that never happened. But then it's uncovered and the Bible is shown, it reflects the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 3. It's one of the earliest known mentions of the Hebrew God Yahweh, Jehovah, and also mentioned is, is due to the house of David. So what I've found in, is in going to places like the Louvre and seeing these sort of things, it confirms the trustworthiness of the Bible. And for a researcher like me, that's really important to be able to see that, yes, I can trust the Bible and, and believe it to be true. Then this painting here in the Louvre. So I've looked at the Code of Hammurabi, some archaeological finds. We'll now look at some paintings. This one here is one big painting. You can see the, 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 somebody standing here. Um, it's 10 metres long, this painting, and nearly 7 metres high. So I, I don't know, yeah, it's uh, how far that would go. About, about, yeah, about about like what we've got here. So it is one big painting. It took the artist 18 months to paint and Napoleon, when he was trying to get it over the Alps, he had to cut it in half and, and haul it with mules <laughs> to get it to the Louvre, uh, but he got it there. And um, but it's, it is one giant painting. And of course it tells the, the biblical story of uh, Jesus turning water into wine. And the artist, uh, Veronese. He's painted about, a I think there's 130 people um, here in this painting and you see the bright colours. What I love about a number of these artists is that they'd take biblical stories and then they'd bring it into their time. And so they would, for instance, this is, um, the location is, is um, uh, Venice and they've taken people from their time and put Jesus there to, so that when people come in from the area from where it's painted, they can say, oh, okay, I can see how this is, this is relevant for me. And the artist has, has done this, this in this case. And what the artist also has is um, lots of playing and uh, we have uh, the um, instruments at this wedding. And this is the artist. What you find is that artists love to paint themselves in their own paintings. And uh, Veronese painted himself here in, in the white silk, uh, playing a, a stringed uh, instrument. Um, we have Jesus with disciples and mother. And uh, then we have up the top um, uh, people with meat cleavers. And uh, then we have a dwarf with a parrot. And uh, this, this is something, I'll, I'll just share with you a little bit of, of history. Um, and even a dog there on the, on the table. They love to include this sort of thing. So what happened in history is when the Protestant Reformation took place, when people like Martin Luther said, look, you know, the church has just gone way off the tracks, then uh, let's, let's reform it. Let's make changes um, in its theology and its, its, its practice and, um, and, and even in, in works of art. Then, the, after the, the death of Luther, the Catholic Church said, OK, we'll have a, they formed the Council of Trent, and uh, in that they said, let's have a look how we should reform the church. So let's see how we should reform the Catholic Church. And one of their big areas of re reform was in the area of painting. 
And what they said is, look, it's time for artists to stop putting dogs in it and <laughs> all of that sort of thing. Let's, let's, uh, let's just make it you know, simple and clear and stop all of this. So when the artist Veronese here, when he, uh, he painted the, um, the Last Supper, well, he was, the, the church hauled him into the Inquisition. He was accused of being a heretic. He said, look, you've painted this badly. This is, this is really wrong. And they accused him of, um, of painting uh, a man with a, uh, a nosebleed, a disciple using a toothpick, um, what they called buffoons or clowns, dwarfs, and maybe worst of all, Germans drinking beer. And so they brought him in and said, OK, you're up before the Inquisition, you're a heretic, and uh, let's, you know, let, let's, let's investigate your paintings. Well, what he did is he said, okay, he thought about it and he said, OK, I'll change the name of the painting from the Last Supper to the Feast of the House of Levi because Jesus said that there were um, tax collectors and sinners there. And then the Catholic Church said, oh, okay, then, fair, fair enough, and they let him off. Um, so that's just a little bit of uh, history from the, the paintings there, that, uh, in, uh, the great paintings that we have in the, in the Louvre. This particular painting, for me, um, uh, is certainly one of, if not, if not my favourite in the Louvre, it's, it's certainly one of them, the young martyr. And, you know, in museums, uh, in, in galleries they often shift paintings around. I don't know if you've noticed that, but if you've been there before, you're looking for it, it's not there, and they, they move them around. But the last time I was there, I remember this particular painting was quite close to the, to the Mona Lisa, and uh, I find that this particular painting, The Young Martyr, uh, quite a captivating painting. And what we find is that the, the artist um, who loved to paint uh, historical and religious paintings, he's painted a, a martyr and, um, and from the time of Diocletian and we see in this painting the, the face, she's pale, she is, uh, Paul Delaroche was the artist, this, she um, has her hands tied and she's in the Tiber River here in Rome and there are a couple of onlookers in the back, and she is floating. Now, what is unknown, this is what I'm saying, is that when you go to a gallery, whether it be Louvre or wherever it happens to be, do some research to find out. Because what the artist did is that he painted the, the I'll come back, the face of the young martyr is actually the face of, of his wife, the love of his life, who died at a very young age, in her early 30s. And so he painted, when he thought of the most beautiful woman in the world to paint, he painted the face of his, uh, of his wife there who died. And the, the heartache it brought to him. He wants, uh, as people come to look at these works of art, he wanted, wants the same, similar sort of emotions to come um, during, uh, as you look at the, this young girl, his artist, the artist's wife, uh, Louise. But let's come back then to the time of, uh, of, of this, where Diocletian um, the, uh, certainly attacked Christians during the th um, 303 AD to 313 AD, these 10 years, became known as the Great Persecution. And at each time all Christian books were burned, anyone suspected of um, following Jesus was tortured to death, either being stretched out on the rack and uh, or dying through crucifixion. And another thing, I know it's a little macabre, but as you go through Europe, I tell you what, if you look at some of those persecution museums, they, it's, they're, they're, you see the full effect of what some of these people went through um, for their faith. And I'll share with you one story. It's in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is a, a, a famous book on, on telling the story of the martyrs. And it just gives us an idea, perhaps, of what may have happened to someone like the young martyr that is, is in the Louvre uh, there today. In this book of martyrs, we can see the painting here, the story. 
of a young couple, Timothy and Maura, and they were married for just three weeks when Timothy was arrested. His crime was to have a copy of the scriptures and uh, he was told that he must hand them over and he said, I won't. And uh, he said, had I children, I would sooner deliver them up to be sacrificed than, be part, than part with the word of God. That's how much dedication he had for the word of God. And so the, uh, the, 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 the torturer said, okay, we'll burn your eyes out. And that way you, you'll never be able to read it again. And then they stretched him out. And as he was being crucified, actually he was crucified upside down. But um, the, his, uh, the, his, his Maura said, recant. And he said, I won't. Well, she said, okay, I'm coming with you. And they were both killed for their faith. And this is the sort of, when I read and I, I see paintings like the young martyr and I, I just imagine, I think of that, I think of just how good we have it um, here in Australia compared with people through history who have died for their faith um, as, as, as Christians. The next painting I want to share with you from the Louvre is from Caravaggio. Now, one of the difficulties that I have in presenting <laughs> is that it seems like uh, everyone is, is my favourite artist or my favourite painting, and, uh, but Caravaggio is certainly my favourite artist. And uh, he, uh, he, yeah, he was just, if anyone was unique, it was, it was this artist. And in this painting of the death of the Virgin, it's, it's virtually a life-size painting, and what Caravaggio did, if you have a look at, uh, at many of the um, artworks on the death of Mary, the mother of Jesus, they often show it as a, oh, such a glorious <laughs> event. And you see Mary and she's raising, going up to heaven and all the rest of it. Well, Caravaggio said, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. And he painted her extremely pale, um, you may not be able to see, but she's barefoot, hand flopped, um, the clothes are, are fairly tatty, um, bald headed <laughs> disciples. Um, you see uh, Mary Magdalene just slumped in, in just mourning. And the church of the day said, no, we're not going to have that for a painting of Mary, um, uh, the death of the Virgin, no way in the world. And they said, that is blasphemy. We're not going to have it like that. But what happened is that because Caravaggio, who, by the way, he was a real rascal. Um, I, I remember reading on one occasion that he, he was in a restaurant and the, the waiter had burnt the artichoke, so he threw it on, uh, <laughs> threw the artichokes on the waiter and he, he, was, uh, uh, he actually murdered someone. He, he, was, he was a real character, if ever there was one and not your, your typical, you know, religious person. And so, but what happened is this. When Caravaggio painted, when people came into a church, instead of coming and looking at a painting that looked so um, different, I guess you could say, they would come and say, wow, okay, that person's just like, me. That maybe I've got hope. I can't reach the level of all these other great saints, but maybe if maybe I've got some hope in this in this Christian life. And maybe I, I, I can I can be involved in that. And Caravaggio had such an impact on people. He understood shame. He understood depression. He understood the, the, the challenges of having a low self-worth. And he painted biblical history from his heart. And when he painted his paintings, it, it really resonated, I believe, even, even today with people, um, as people see that the Christian faith is for everyone, not just those who, who think that they're holier than, than other people. So let's come in, uh, in conclusion to the works of, uh, of, of Leonardo da Vinci who finished as court artist to King Francis I. And in the Louvre there's, um, uh, oh, hang on, that's Caravaggio. Here's Leonardo da Vinci. Da, da Vinci. In the Louvre there are eight paintings from uh, da Vinci. 
And uh, uh, this, St. John, St. John the Baptist, that's probably one of the most, well, certainly the most unique uh, paintings of John the Baptist. Uh, if anything, he's, you know, he's sort of seen as a little bit, yeah, un unusual there. Um, not the, the typical John the Baptist, but he, he's pointing there, and Da Vinci, uh, this is in, in the Louvre, and then the Virgin of the Rocks, where I was in London, in the National Gallery there, they have a, another Virgin of the Rocks by Da Vinci. And so that's just an example, of course, of the work that, um, that, that um, Da Vinci has in the, in the Louvre, but the Mona Lisa, of course, is the most famous uh, painting um, in the world. Who is she? Well, there's debate, but uh, the, I think the most popular view is that she, as the, the model, is the wife of the man who actually commissioned the painting. And so that is the, 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 the general view. Um, and certainly um, the, the thought is that there are a number of versions before coming to this. She had a bigger smile and a whole lot of different thoughts on, on this painting. We'll, we'll talk more about it tomorrow. But one thing for sure, she's a survivor. She uh, hung on the walls of Napoleon. She was stolen for two years, which we'll go into in depth tomorrow. She survived the Nazis during World War II. She had acid thrown on her. A young Bolivian threw a rock at her. She had a distraught Russian woman throw a, 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 one of the Louvre souvenir mugs at her. Um, she had last, just last year, a fellow in a, a protester in a wheelchair came along and hurled cake at her. And he was arrested. <laughs> and so she's a survivor. But once again, if you go to the Louvre and you see the Mona Lisa, remember I was saying how people just come and have a little look? That's what happens. Because you're there and uh, you're, you're all jammed in and everyone's squeezing because this is what they've come to the Louvre to see. And so everyone's jammed in and they've got their cameras up taking photos. So it's hardly a pleasant experience. And people are just there for a few seconds and they've said, OK, I've seen the Mona Lisa, now let's move on. But there is certainly something special about um, the Mona Lisa. And no doubt her smile is a, a key to, to her fame. Our portraits have historically been very sterile. Even if you look at some uh, photos from a hundred years ago of different people who are just sort of standing there like this and uh, very static, very serious. But here we have a woman who is sitting open, smiling. It's like she's inviting a conversation with the viewer. And this is, is something that has uh, attracted so many um, people and we'll explore more on this in, uh, in, in, our, future, in our future meetings. Speaking of which, um, tomorrow, Tomorrow morning, we're going to look at the concept of Mona Lisa. Are you more valuable? Now, tonight's been more of a, I guess, more of a, I guess, a, a tour, a factual side of uh, presentation. Um, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we're going to apply this very much spiritually to look at, at what our value is. Um, and uh, I think that it would be a very encouraging uh, message for you. As we, as we look at our, at our self-worth and our value and, and, and sort of taking from paintings but then applying it from biblical concepts to our own life. So um, tomorrow at 11 o'clock is one that uh, yeah, I really encourage you to come to. And then tomorrow we have lunch here. Is that right, Daniel? And then, and then at 2 o'clock we're looking at the, the ship of fools and how to succeed in life. So tomorrow afternoon will be quite a nautical uh, series of paintings and we're going to look at Raft of Medusa in, uh, in the Louvre. This painting here, Ship of Fools, is in the Louvre uh, and we're going to, to investigate um, what really is our purpose in life, what does it mean to be a successful in life, looking at some of these paintings and I'm going to show you a series of paintings tomorrow that half of New York City came out to look at. It was so significant to people trying to succeed in life as they saw the secrets to success. So that's tomorrow um, afternoon.